Hey, welcome back everyone. We're on the home stretch. These last three lectures are just a broad overview of ecology and related topics. So I'm expecting fairly high grades on this section because it's mostly just vocab and you know, there's a couple of concepts that you have to internalize. But if you can answer all the vocabulary and then of course go through the uh, the notes, the, the, the summary lectures, and understand what's in that, you'll be in really good shape, and I'm expecting high grades on this section. So ecology is the study of interactions of organisms with each other and their physical environment. How is the organism adapted to that environment? You know, what behaviors or uh, metabolic pathways, you know, or, or things along those lines that allow them to survive there? Organisms exist as part of a population, which is defined as all of these members of the same species in a particular area. So you can have, you know, cats in Florida and Canada, and those are two separate populations, unless you want to like zoom out and be like, okay, the continental population. So it really kind of depends on the size of the area you're looking at is how it was, uh, defines what's included within the population, but it's all the members of a particular species within that area. And then a community is all of the various populations, so all the different species in that area, basically. And the ecosystem is a community of populations as well as the non-living environment. And uh, your energy flow affects the success of an organism, for instance, and, and you're going to hear me say this about 50 times probably. There's only about 10% of the energy that makes it from one trophic level to the next, meaning that you can have a heck of a lot more uh, primary consumers like herbivores running around than you can, you know, pri uh, primary consumers like the things that eat that first level, and then even fewer, you know, apex predators. Uh, apex predators, though, are quite essential for the maintenance of a particular community or, or ecosystem because without them biodiversity plummets they're what's known as keystone species uh, and we saw this in Yellowstone when the, when the wolves were wiped out uh, it was actually there was actually physical damage being done because of the over to, to the park itself because of the overgrowth of um, deer and whatnot because they were eating away all of the vegetation near the banks of the rivers and it was causing the or waterways or whatever causing them to collapse and so they reintroduce wolves and they start culling the population and vegetation can take root around the waterways and reinforce it and whole other ecosystems spring up around that and biodiversity goes through the roof there has been a few um, well-intended but misguided attempts to save certain things, for instance, removing sea stars from coral reefs or uh, removing cats from islands in order to try to save seabirds because, you know, cats eat birds. Well, the thing about it is, is when they removed the cats from the island, the seabirds went extinct because the cats were keeping the rat population in check, and rats eat seabird eggs and young. So they were far more dangerous to the birds than the cats had ever thought about being. Similar kind of thing with the starfish. So, like, we got to get rid of these starfish because, you know, some of them eat coral. Well, the thing is, is they killed a lot of other things that hurt the coral. Uh, a lot worse than they did. So you get rid of them, biodiversity plummets, the coral takes a hit, and you get like one or two species just absolutely take over the whole area. So be very careful, or you have, you have to be very careful if you start thinking about adding or removing species from an area, because it has far-reaching consequences. Population growth. So each population has a particular growth pattern, and the size can change according to the per capita rate of increase. So think about like rats good, is a good example. Those suckers can 
if I remember correctly, it's they can have a new litter like every three months, and then it's you know it's a fairly large litter size. You know, I think it's like six on average, six or eight, something like that. But it can be more. They could they their population grows extremely rapidly. If I'm remembering correctly, within a year, a single breeding pair could produce like half a billion rats. It's it's insane. Um, but then you take something like whales, uh, who have a gestation period that is measured in years and then even longer for the calf to you know reach maturity and be able to survive on its own and that, so they, I mean their their population grows incredibly slowly it's measured on decade scales to add individuals instead of uh, months biotic potential is the highest per capita rate increase for a population and factors include included in this uh, potential are the reproductive potential of the population, food availability, absence of disease, and absence of predators. Uh, obviously, if you are in an environment with unlimited food, no disease, and nothing to eat you, and you have a very um, reproductively successful population, then it's going to explode without limit, essentially. If you allow E. coli to have those uh, conditions, then if I want to say it's within a couple of days or a week, something like that. My memory's a little hazy. But a single E. coli could produce a mass of E. coli roughly the size of the Earth if given unlimited resources uh, without, you know, predation or anything. It's the growth curve on these things is, is ridiculous. It's, it's truly exponential, which leads into our patterns here. So exponential growth is a J-shaped curve with two phases. You have the lag phase and growth is small because the population is small. These things grow by like percentage. And if you've ever tried to add up percentages for the first, you know, however long, it's minuscule increases but then once you reach critical mass it just takes off which is where you get to your exponential growth phase and the growth accelerates and the population exhibits its biotic potential meaning it's doing like the maximum it can there the thing about this is exponential growth is usually unsustainable due to environmental resistances you will never find anywhere in the universe a place where you can you can have unlimited exponential growth. The, there's just not enough space and energy anywhere for that to happen. Even in the whole universe itself, you would run out very quickly. So that brings us to environmental resistance. And that encompasses all the environmental con uh, conditions that prevent populations from reaching their maximum growth, uh, growth rate. So limited food supply, accumulation of waste products, increased competition, and increased predation. So limited food supply is pretty obvious. There's only so much you can eat within a given area. Uh, accumulation of waste products, um, that should be fairly obvious to be a problem because your waste products are not something that you can use for your metabolism. So they're often toxic and, and in high enough concentrations are dangerous to the organisms themselves increased competition the more you put in a given area the the more the more organisms in a given area the more they are going to have to compete for those limited resources and then increased predation as the population increases you can support a larger population of predators and they'll kind of keep the 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 uh increase in the predator population will kind of help to keep the prey in check, which is vital because you know, most species have this strategy of produce as many offspring as possible with the hope that some of them will statistically survive. And uh, because, it's, because it's a very effective strategy. But left unchecked, they would over, like they would overwhelm their environment, starve everything, or consume all the resources and starve everything else to death, and then finally themselves die. Like rats in particular are a perfect example of this. 
they they're rodents so they're not picky about what they eat they will happily kill and eat each other or eat each other alive uh if the case or they'll, they'll happily kill and eat just about anything that they can overpower they'll eat each other alive larger organisms that are somehow incapacitated or stuck are fair game there are places where people will not go camping because the rats are known to go for the eyes when you're asleep or uh, even squirrels in some places they'll eat bone they'll eat plants uh, meat they don't care and they reproduce at such a ridiculous rate if they were allowed to go unchecked then the entire human population as well as pretty much anything else would starve to death just because of how quickly they consume resources and they also are quite good at carrying you know disease and pestilence around uh, the black plague for instance now i know a lot of people will say well that it was actually like the particular flea that was on the rats that was what carried it but the rats are the ones who spread the fleas everywhere uh, they also carry things like hantavirus and uh, it's, it's, they're just disgusting little creatures. So we need predators to keep their population in check. And you rem if you remove the predators, then the prey would actually go extinct. Uh, they, they form this kind of nice symbiotic relationship where they balance each other out and it, is, it helps the overall health of the environment as a whole. So logistic growth, this is basically when your logarithmic growth bumps into the uh, limitations put on, placed upon it by the environment. So it's this nice little S-shaped curve and you'll reach, eventually you'll reach the carrying capacity, which is how many organisms can be supported in that environment. And the thing is, is it doesn't just hit like a magic number and stay there. Like let's say the carrying capacity is just for conversation's sake, 500 rats in a given area. Well, the population isn't just going to sit there at 500. You know, one rat dies, another one's born. That's not how it works. They're going to frequently exceed the carrying capacity and then die off to some level below it and then come back up. So you get this kind of oscillation above and below the carrying capacity and it's kind of by, by basically you take the average between those peaks and troughs and that tells you about where the carrying capacity is going to be and the longer a population has been in a relatively stable environment the smaller those oscillations will be but you know there's plenty of seasonal peaks you know for instance the environment in the spring or early summer is much more suited to uh, the majority of organisms so the carrying capacity during that time of year is going to be a lot higher compared to say the dead of winter so again seasonal fluctuations in populations so you kind of have to take like a an average to come up with your carrying capacity you will need to know the different phases of logistic growth here so you've got your lag phase and your exponential phase just like we had before the deceleration phase is where you kind of start getting from the j to the s curve and so basically the population growth rate is starting to slow down and then you will reach the stable equilibrium phase where there's hardly any population growth because you know they're basically dying off at the same rate they're being born but again that can kind of oscillate up and down around the carrying capacity basically everything we just said is in these two graphs lag exponential phase for your logarithmic growth and then your logistics growth you start with your lag phase, you go to exponential, but then you start slowing down here, you hit your equilibrium, and then you start oscillating around the carrying capacity in your stable equilibrium. Survivorship. So there's a slight flaw with the model above because it assumes that all individuals are the same age, but in reality, everyone's at a different age and different stage of their life within the population. I mean, there's like groups and waves, but you know, they're all different. So a cohort is a group of individuals born at the same time. Uh, we would think of it like a generation. So plotting the number of survivors over time gives you the survivorship curve, meaning how many people from a given cohort or individuals of a species within, within a given go cohort survive during a given period of time. 
So you've got three types. So type one, most individuals survive until old age. So that would be, you know, humans, at least um, modern humans. For a very long time, that was not the case. People commonly didn't make it out of their 20s. Uh, type two, you have a consistent decrease over time. So like songbirds, you know, there's this nice linear relationship between age and death. And then type three, most individuals die early and they're given an example of like oysters. Um, sea turtles is a good example. I mean, think of how many hundreds of thousands spawn on the beaches and most of them don't make it off that beach. But then those who do, uh, well, even then most of them don't survive out in the ocean either. But then, you know, the ones that do survive can come back and reproduce in mass numbers. Age distribution. So you can divide the population into three groups. You've got pre-reproductive, reproductive, and post-reproductive. So this kind of depends on the species a little bit. But basically, pre-reproductive would be, you know, adolescents, newborns, kids, that sort of thing. They're not old enough to reproduce yet. Reproductive, you're in a period of, of time when you're capable of having children. And then post-reproductive population, you're no longer capable of doing so. Just too old. And that kind of varies depending on the population. You know, humans, for instance, like human males are technically capable of of having offspring up until you know they die basically not not in every case but you know it is still possible uh, human females though after menopause can they're definitely post reproductive at that point so you know it's kind of give and take uh, for a lot of species it's the a lot of other species though they, they hit like this hard limit you know it's like you're you turn 12 now that's it for you kind of thing. Unless you're talking like hydras, in which case eh, you throw in a blender and they revert into like an, a newborn state essentially and then go through their life cycle again. So basically these are just generalizations and you worry about the specifics when you deal with that specific species. Uh, replacement reproduction occurs when couples only have two children. So you know, two die, two are born basically. Uh, no population growth and uh, this tends to be, this uh, replacement reproduction tends to be the case in more developed countries but less developed countries have more women entering reproductive years than leaving them. Basically that's because you have to have a lot of kids to ensure that enough survive to have kids of their own. Uh, there's with Traditionally speaking, there's been high infant mortality, plenty of childhood illnesses uh, would wipe out, um, you know, two or three of your kids, you know, measles, mumps, rubella, or they would get polio or smallpox or tuberculosis or something, even into adulthood sin or, you know, early adolescence. And that's just assuming, and that's just pestilence, you know, there's plenty of other things to that are lethal to young developing uh, individuals. So that's still kind of the way it is in these less developed countries. But in more developed countries, then we tend to reproduce, you know, roughly at this replacement rate. So if you look here on the left, you've got a fairly stable amount. You've got your where most, most developing countries, you actually have a slightly smaller number of pre-reproductive individuals than you do reproductive because people are just having fewer kids. And then there's this gradual tapering, you know, as time goes by, you're statistically less likely to survive to the next day. So, you know, there's this kind of slow die off as you reach your maximum lifespan. So this is about what a more developed country would look like. In less developed countries, though, very few people make it to old age compared to how many are born in a given cohort. And it's just, there's this gradual dying off. You have tons of kids, you know, uh, and then a few of them, relatively speaking, make it to the reproductive age. And then, so you have density 
independent and density dependent factors that can that regulate interactions within within populations. So your independent are your abiotic factors, the weather, natural disasters, like those sorts of things are you know, roughly the same for populations of all sizes. Your density dependent factors are your biotic factors, you know, how much food is there, that sort of thing. Competition, predation, uh, parasitism, disease, you know, that sort of thing. So competition occurs when two members of a different species try to utilize the same uh, resource. And it's, uh, density, it's a density dependent factor because the more there, the more competition. And one thing to tie into this real quick is this competitive exclusion principle. So no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. If resources are limited, eventually one will outcompete the other. The The short way of, of summarizing this is complete competitors cannot coexist. One will make the other extinct. Whichever one is better at competing for that environment will eventually render the other extinct. An ecological niche is a role that a species plays in the community. It has its habitat and spe specific habitat, specific interaction with other organisms includes energy, nutrition, survival, and reproductive needs. So one way you can get around this is resource partitioning. So you kind of divide up who's in what niche where, and that decreases the competition between the species and allows uh, two species to exist within you know, a similar area, not exactly the same. So, you know, for instance, this one, the smaller barnacle here is much more resistant to being dried out. So it dominates the top up here where the tide can uh, leave them exposed to the sun. Uh, but this one, the other larger barnacle, is just better at fighting for a particular area. So it dominates down here where it's always underwater and they compete here in this intermediate zone where, you know, where the tide doesn't always leave them exposed or doesn't leave them exposed long enough to affect the larger barnacle. So they kind of go back and forth here fighting over this area. But they have their you know, little, their respective niches that only they can survive there. So it's just kind of a, kind of a way to help, help manage you know, uh, the limited space available so that you actually end up with higher diversity because you've got two different species there instead of them uh, wiping each other out. So in this case, they're not completely, they're not complete competitors because they have slightly different uh, niches that, that allow them to survive in slightly different areas. But if they, if they had to compete for like the same spot, then one or the other would eventually win. Predation occurs when one organism, the predator, feeds on another, which is be the prey. And they tend to Predator prey, prey populations tend to cycle instead of maintaining a steady state. So if the predators overkill the prey population, predator population declines because, you know, they starve to death. If the prey overshoots the carrying capacity and suffers a crash, this would cause the predator population to crash, uh, again, due to the lack of food. And what they're talking about here is like, when they say overshoot the carrying capacity, they... The basically just means that there are more members of the prey species there that can be supported by the resources at hand, and so they die off massively because they're all starving to death, fighting over the same resources and that sort of thing. And so because they get wiped out, well, suddenly the predators don't have a food source anymore. But in either case, you've got these alternating you know, valleys and troughs. Anti-predator defenses, so co-evolution is when two species adapt in response to selective pressures imposed by each other. So for instance, this little caterpillar has these false eye spots on it, or you know, this bug has a big fake head on it, makes itself look bigger, more opposing, and if a bird tries to snap at it, it's gonna go for the fake head and his, you know, his actual head will survive. Uh, poison dart frogs, any animal that you see that's real brightly colored, leave it alone because that's its way of saying, I'm poisonous, touch me and die. Uh, mimicry. So this is a, this is a form of uh, co-evolution. So you have, you know, yellow jacket, which will sting and hurt. And then you've got this little 
fly over here. It looks a lot like a yellow jacket, but you know, just a lot. It's smaller. If you really look at it, you'll notice. But at first glance, you're probably thinking it's a yellow jacket, so you're going to leave it alone. So that's a form. So, but there's two sub uh, categories of mimicry. So you've got Batesian mimicry, which is a prey that is not harmful, mimics a successful an uh, anti predator de defense. So usually warning colors are involved. So that would be like some other little frog looking like a poison dart frog because the, the predators know leave the poison dart frog alone so they're going to leave the other thing alone too. Or like this little yellow jacket and the fly here. Uh, if something is afraid of the yellow jacket, they're probably going to leave the fly alone too. And then malaria mimicry, a species that... Um, Species resemble each other, and they both have successful defenses. Like the bumblebee and uh, you know, the yellow jacket wasp here are malarian because they both have a similar appearance, and they both sting to defend themselves. You can also just look like a predator. So this thing on the left here is not a snake. It's actually a little um, moth larvae. But it looks a lot like a snake. So a bird is going to think twice before messing with that. Or you can just be a nasty little so-and-so and fling boiling acid from your buttocks at anything that messes with you. So, yeah, don't ever poke a bombardier beetle. This guy's going to be hurting for a while. Other ways of surviving, you have uh, distraction displays and living in groups or herds. So a good example of distraction display would be like a skinks. They leave their tail behind. This brightly colored tail, that's not, you know, slightly iridescent and all flashy, and it'll wiggle around like crazy. So odds are the predator's going to notice that, and not the you know kind of dingy colored or you know brownish kind of dingy colored little lizard that just scurried off. Or you know you just live in a herd because if you know, somebody's getting eaten, but you're one of a thousand. Well, odds are it's not going to be you. Symbiosis, uh, basically two different things living in close relationship to each other, two different species. And you've got three types of symbiosis. So parasitism, uh, parasitism commensalism, and mutualism. And parasitism, one species benefits at the cost of the other. Commensalism, one species gains something, it doesn't really cost the other one anything. And then mutualism, both species benefit. And these are simplistic categorizations. Often it's more of like there's some cause, like there's a pro and there's pros and cons to both, but overall it's a positive, or you know, overall it's a negative. So, you know, just for our purposes, just know the simplistic categories and you're good. So uh, often a parasite will derive nourishment from a host, which, uh, as you can imagine, being slowly eaten from the inside is not beneficial to the host. Uh, there are parasites in all kingdoms, bacteria, protists, fungus, plants, animals. They're just everywhere. Most organisms on this planet, as far as we know, are actually parasitic in one form or another because it's a heck of a lot easier to be a parasite than it is to do everything on your own. Besides nourishment, hosts provide parasites with some other benefits including a place to live or a mechanic or the mechanical means for dispersing offspring. Many parasites have primary and secondary hosts with the secondary host being a vector that transmits the parasite to the next primary host like um, mosquitoes transmitting malaria from one person to the next, or uh, Toxoplasma gondii. Its uh, primary host is, uh, is a cat. It needs to live in a cat to complete its life cycle, but they're, uh, they're transmitted from one cat to the next via rats, and what ends up, when it infects a rat, it infects their brain. And it makes them far less fearful, like they become just real ballsy little rodents. And uh, they also become very attracted and interested in the smell of cat urine. So when you have a, a rat that's no longer afraid and likes the smell of cat urine, it's probably going to get eaten. So that kind of helps the parasite complete its life cycle. 
and it can also infect humans. In humans, at least in adults, it doesn't really seem to do much except put little cysts in your brain that aren't even large enough to do anything, except maybe slow your reaction times because there's a different uh, disproportionate amount of people who have been infected with toxoplasmosis who end up in a car wreck. So maybe. Uh, but because it infects the brain, you should do everything in your power to avoid contracting toxoplasmosis while pregnant because it can cause uh, severe uh, birth defects in a developing fetus, uh, up to and including death. But it's my personal theory that uh, toxoplasmosis is responsible for uh, cat ladies because, you know, liking the smell of cat urine. Though that's not been scientifically evaluated yet, uh, I find it amusing, so I'm sticking with it. Commensalism. One species benefits and the other is neither benefited nor harmed. So sometimes, like, you know, the you can get transport or, tra or transportation or a home from something. Uh, clownfish and sea anemones, for an example. Egrets, they used to use ox peckers as an example for this because, uh, or I'm sorry, for mutualism, because the, the ox peckers would, um, you'd always see them on, on the back of like oxen or, you know, bison or a water buffalo or whatever, and they seemed, they appeared to be eating like ticks and fleas and stuff, you know, removing parasites. But that's not all they do. They're actually somewhat vampiric. And so they will pick open holes in their in the skin of these uh, cattle and drink their blood in addition to eating the parasites. So technically it's like parasitism, but the textbooks are slowly getting around to removing those because it's not accurate. But it's kind of one of those ideas that just lingered forever. Mutualism, the symbiotic relationship where both organisms benefit, and the degree of benefit may not be equal. In pollinate plants are given nectar, and the, or, or sometimes they'll just eat the pollen grains. Uh, so they're getting a little bit of food, but as they're moving from you know plant to plant, they're spreading pollen, so it massively increases the uh, reproductive success of the plants. So technically the flower, the flowering plant is the one that comes out ahead on that. Okay, so mutualism, or, or uh, continuing with mutualism here, you have these cleaning symbioses. So, you know, the big fish here could obviously eat this little one, but the little fish is providing a service by removing parasites and cleaning, you know, debris and whatnot. So, by letting this little guy live and missing a meal, you're actually gaining more benefit than that by just removing parasites and helping you know, keep you clean or whatever. There's another type of, kind of similar to this, type of parasitism that is not listed here called um, replacement parasitism. And there's only one, like one really good example for that. And it's kind of weird. So there's these um, little isopods, which, you know, think of uh, roly-poly because they're, they're, those are isopods as well. But it's like a bigger one and they live in the ocean. And what they do is they, they'll find a fish, they'll swim into its gills, and um, then they basically use the, their sharp mouth parts and their limbs to latch on to the fish's tongue and burrow into the largest blood vessels for supplying the tongue. And they will slowly just sap away the blood that's supposed to be supplying the tongue, which then over time atrophies and becomes virtually non-existent. And uh, what you're left with is this isopod kind of just sitting there drinking the fish's blood and functioning basically as a tongue because it's still attached to, you know, the muscular stump so it can be moved around and manipulated a little bit like a tongue. But it's a pretty terrible tongue, but it does kind of replace the function. So what well, would be really cool is if, you know, there were parasitic organisms that like can replace a kidney or something. That would be awesome. But we don't really know of any such thing and it would be kind of hard for something like that to have evolved in the first place. But 
it would be cool. There's also like a really crappy horror film that I've not gotten around to watching because I've not been that bored yet. Basically about these isopods like starting infecting people. Tangent aside, um, ecological succession is a change in the community's composition that is directed and follows a continuous pattern of extinction and colonization by new species. So your primary succession is the establishment of the plant community that's formed in an area lacking soil formation. Secondary is the return of a community to its natural vegetation following disturbance. And then a pioneer species is the first species to begin the process of secondary succession. So that's usually like you had a volcano come through and wipe everything out. There's not really a lot of soil left with all this volcanic rock around. So you get things like mosses and, and lichens come in and they will break down the rocks and deposit soil and slowly make it to where other things can come in and, and uh, restore the balance to what it used to be. So they, uh, you also have, like in grasslands, you know, will slowly uh, succumb in some places to uh, forests. So you've got your grasses, low shrubs, high shrubs, shrub tree mix, low trees, and then high trees. And that's just the forest growing and spreading out that way. And typically over here where the grasses are, the soil is just not as good, but it's gradually enriched by, you know, all the biomass being left behind by these other species. Uh, so that's it for chapter 34. If you've got any questions, comments, concerns, or anything, let me know. Be aware that the final is coming up shortly after exam five, and it is cumulative. So make sure you set aside a, a, the appropriate amount of time to prepare for that, and I'll see you in the next one.